UW360 is proudly supported by BECU, a not-for-profit, member-owned credit union. Pacific Office Automation, copy, print, workflow, and IT, problem solved. Hi, I'm Samantha Rund, and this is UW360, and this is Packer Hall, the first new building in an expanding campus for world-class education and research at the Foster School of Business. Since 1917, the Foster School has turned out leaders who think differently and make a difference. Later in our program, we'll introduce you to a Foster alum who's putting Seattle fashion on the map. We'll also show you a tiny wireless sensor that can read neural and muscular signals to aid in rehabilitation therapy. We'll take you to a furniture design studio, then check out some of the research projects that UW students are involved in. And our first story takes us to the Museum of Flight. The University of Washington has been in the forefront of space exploration, providing many of the engineers and astronauts who have contributed to the design and operation of the space shuttles. And now alumni Bonnie Dunbar and Doug King are focused on tomorrow's great minds. They see the end of the space shuttle era as an opportunity for the next generation to take its own giant leap for mankind. Go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Two, one, booster ignition, and the final liftoff of Discovery. As the era of the space shuttle draws to a close, Discovery now making one last reach for the stars. It's a bittersweet moment for scores of University of Washington graduates. They worked as engineers, technicians, researchers, and astronauts on an engineering marvel. The first spaceship to look like an airplane and able to carry both passengers and cargo into space, then return them to Earth. And although the space shuttles will no longer fly, there is a dynamic duo of university grads determined the shuttles will continue to spark flights of imagination. The alums are Doug King, president of Seattle's Museum of Flight, and Bonnie Dunbar, former museum president, current executive director of Wings Over Washington, and one of 12 university alums to have held the job title of astronaut. It's a job Bonnie never regrets. I would have paid to do this. Never bored. Never bored with the flights, never bored with the training, never bored with preparation or anything, and never blasé. Each flight was different. It's work. An astronaut has to have a technical degree. I elected to become an engineer. Those are the tools that allowed me to do this. You need those tools. And it is that passion for the tools of exploration that make Doug and Bonnie a formidable team. First, they're working to bring more space exploration artifacts to the museum. The Space Gallery will house a full fuselage shuttle trainer for visitors to explore. And by showing the ingenuity behind those artifacts, they hope to inspire the next generation of engineers, scientists, and explorers. That's the whole point of artifacts, really. There's something about the real things. I mean, these planes around me here aren't models. These are the real planes. They flew. They're the, the pioneers of aviation. Those things need to be here so that when people look back, they can see how was it really. That's the purpose of a museum but we can also use them to inspire the people that will create the story of the second hundred years of flight. No pressure, no pressure. Is the oxygen and I think for the youth today, they need to understand they too can be these agents of change and innovation. If anyone understands how interest in space exploration leads to great things, it's Bonnie Dunbar. Raised on a hard scrabble cattle farm in Sunnyside, she devoured science fiction books and saw life as an adventure. And I thought, this is the life. I want to go over the next hill. I want to learn. I want to understand the universe around me. Inspired by the Apollo missions, she eventually earned two masters and a PhD. At the University of Washington, Bonnie worked on early development of the ceramic heat-resistant tiles used on the shuttles. Some 20 years later, she blasted into space. I didn't have an opportunity to really reflect on the mission and what we'd just all been through till after I got back down on the ground. And I remember watching the film of the launch and thinking, boy, I was on that. It was my first flight. Uh, I think I might have been the only rookie. And I'm just thinking to myself, 
please don't let me screw this up. <laughs> Bonnie flew five shuttle missions, her last with a fellow UW grad, Michael Anderson, an astronaut who perished in a subsequent mission during Columbia's breakup upon re-entry. It was a risk all shuttle astronauts understood. So you have to look at, first of all, the shuttle in itself is an uh, engineering research experiment. We, we pushed the boundaries on engine development, materials development, even the use of computers was the first fly-by-wire. In other words, no cables going to the ailerons. It's all computer signals. We pushed all that technology. It is ironically the loss of another shuttle and crew that ultimately brought Doug King to the Museum of Flight. He was instrumental in building Challenger Centers for Space Science Education, an idea born from the tragedy of the Challenger explosion. The families of the Challenger crew, led by June Scobie, continued the flight's educational agenda by creating over 50 sites where students emulate space missions. We opened the one here at the Museum of Flight in 1993. It was um, among the first 10 or so. 25 years later, on the 25th anniversary of the Challenger accident, June stood at Kennedy Space Center and said, the flight failed, but the mission's been a success. Doug and Bonnie want the museum to continue that mission by building one of the strongest aerospace education programs in the country. They want today's young students to join the long line of university alums and many others who taught us what it means to push boundaries, face failures, and find adventures. We want to make sure that the young kids coming through understand what it takes in terms of science, technology, engineering, and math to go do this. We live right in the time when humans first left the Earth. Who can imagine what will be a thousand years from now, even a hundred years from now? But those kids that are in, in school today are the ones that will write the next step in that journey. And that will be the generation that will help us go to other worlds. Three, two, one, and lift up. For information about the Space Gallery and all the programs at the Museum of Flight, you'll find a link on our website, uwtv.org slash uw360. And now we're going to visit an architecture class where students are turning out some very personal designs of furniture. Drills, saws, sanders, power tools. This is not your typical classroom. This is Furniture Studio 504, where graduate architect students take their design skills to the next level. Each student designs a piece of furniture, but also has to learn the skills to build it by the end of the 10-week quarter. So you want to bend it to here, not to here. Tell us what makes this class different, and why furniture? Furniture requires many of the same design skills and many of the same kind of uh, talents that uh, buildings do. A printed out template. When you design a building and you draw things that are difficult to make, sometimes impossible to make, someone else solves that problem. When you draw something that's very difficult to make or impossible to make in Furniture Studio, you have to solve the problem. You have to finish. It's not just, you know, make this cut and you're done. It's make this cut and see what the material does. Students are asked to design something with a particular space in mind, like their own home. Liz Banco kept her daughter in mind for her piece. So this is bench height that you can sit on. This little piece on the floor is kind of designed to be a little more kid friendly and just a little more whimsical. Um, I, have a, I have a toddler at home, um, so she could sit on that and then the whole thing will actually spin around and there will be access in the back to store things inside it. Not every student designs a piece with their own home in mind. Natalie took this class as a chance to make a personalized gift. Um, this dining table is actually for my sister and my uh, recent brother-in-law. It's their wedding gift. While some students are most focused on design, others enjoy the beauty of the raw materials they choose to work with. And so, as you can see with this, you know, the top has a pretty intricate grain. You know, you've got some riveting here, you've got some, uh, the branch and how that kind of comes out and goes out across there. My primary goal for this course is to help students develop realistic strategies to bring projects to a successful conclusion. For students to go through a design, design development, design to making, choosing materials, uh, and actually using those materials to achieve a final result in a realistic, uh, a 
affordable manner that they can translate into the making of buildings. The class was started by Professor Andy Vanags, and after years of teaching, his class has left a legacy of furniture. Over the years, some fantastic pieces have been made, and Professor Jeffrey Oxner has written a book about this very class. From the beginning, the students in the studio entered their pieces in competitions and did very well, in many times beating professional furniture makers. At the end of the quarter, students present the pieces they have spent 10 long weeks designing and building to await their final critique and grade. Throughout the process, most have grown very attached to their pieces. They're in love with them. They put their boyfriends and girlfriends at risk. They become, you know, really cherished possessions. Uh, they're absolutely spectacular. You know, every single one of them, just spectacular. Jeffrey Oxner's book, Furniture Studio, Materials, Craft, and Architecture, is scheduled for publication by the University of Washington Press in early 2012. It will include illustrations of many of the pieces designed by the class. You can find a link to the University of Washington Press on our website, uwtv.org slash uw360. And when we come back, we'll show you the tiny product of some exciting research. In the world of wireless sensors, size matters. And for many applications, the tinier, the better. On a quest for the ultra-small and lightweight, assistant professor Brian Otis and his electrical engineering research team are pushing sensor technology into new frontiers. Take a look at the bumblebee. The Bumblebee is a, a small wireless system that we have developed for recording biosignals. The heart of the Bumblebee is a single silicon integrated circuit. This is a chip that's just a couple millimeters on a side. But this chip contains about 10,000 transistors. These are individual devices used for amplification, computation, and communication. We've assembled this all onto a small printed circuit board that's powered from a small watch battery. When you put this all together, that is what the, the Bumblebee is. The thing that we're really proud about uh, with the Bumblebee is that we've integrated a lot of new technologies together onto a single chip. We have a new mechanism for amplifying signals that consumes very little power. In addition, we have a new type of radio that we've integrated onto this chip that consumes very low amounts of power and consumes a very small amount of space on this printed circuit board. This makes the system very small. We can power it from a small battery and it lasts for a long period of time. The concept for the Bumblebee really came out of collaborations that we've had with other people on campus who had the need to do recording from the brain and from the body, and there simply were not the tools available to do this kind of research. Brian Otis and Chet Moritz and I have put together a new therapy technique. It's actually taking an older technique and applying new technology to it to bring it to the therapeutic world for individuals with movement disorders such as stroke, traumatic brain injury and cerebral palsy. With the help of Brian Otis and his wireless electrodes, we use signals recorded from muscles which may be impaired. So the process itself is actually already helping some people to move their hands better. And we hope to understand the neural mechanisms behind that recovery as well as deliver an effective therapy. So really what we developed is a, is a research tool. Over the course of around three years or so, we've developed core technologies that make a really useful tool and we've realized that we can apply it to applications beyond uh, simply research. I'm actually very enthusiastic about what Brian has put together with this Bumblebee technology. I think that we are at the beginnings of a uh, revolution in wireless sensor networks. There uh, is a lot of interest in uh, the energy field, in monitoring uh, energy distribution systems, in national security opportunities, and even in uh, personal and home applications for wireless sensor networks. And I think Brian has the smarts and has developed some technology that could have really wide applications. We're really a team that is there to help Brian figure out how he can take the, the, what he's done, which is fantastic research, and turn it into a business. C4C has, has really helped us a lot, especially in terms of doing patent searches, staking out what the uh, patent landscape looked like for the technologies that we were working with. And one of the things that was impressive is their ability to quickly get up to speed on the advanced technologies that we were inventing. 
I think of C4C as kind of a catch-all for any type of issue related to commercializing our professor's technology. Working with Mike Clark has been, has been wonderful. He's helped us in a, in a variety of different areas. One of them is helping us gain access to C4C funding. The other is helping us with our IP protection strategy. Um, thirdly, he's helped us form connections with people in the region. Brian and I talk frequently on at least a weekly basis. The issues can be widely varied. It can be getting funding for the next stage of their development. It might be the latest business idea or exploring new markets for their technology. My work here with Brian and some of the other researchers uh, is a testament to the progress the Center for Commercialization has made in the last several years in, in developing the capabilities of the UW as an engine for new companies. This opportunity for Brian to learn about forming a business um, is a fantastic experience, a great tool in his professional toolbox. He'll be able to help other students that he's working with think about businesses that they may want to start. So uh, hopefully this whole experience not only will see Bumblebee technology that he's developed uh, come to life in the real world, but will also add to his abilities to mentor and to teach students here about business. I'm really fortunate that I am doing my dream job. I get to come in every day, work with excited students, and work with collaborators across the campus and, and across the region to do things that nobody has ever done before. At the University of Washington, thousands of undergraduate students in all academic disciplines have the opportunity to participate in research. At the annual undergraduate research symposium, they present what they've learned to students, faculty, and the community. Our research is about looking at the dispersal of gooey duck larvae within Quartermaster Harbor. It's a thin layer of silicon on a substrate of sapphire. An exploration into a new medium of art, which is this hologram. At the University of Washington, thousands of undergraduate students participate in research, enhancing their education and expanding their views of the world. Every spring since 1998, they showcase their projects at the Undergraduate Research Symposium. I came up with this smart shoes, which will be able to detect the surface and prevent injuries. We used Hubble Space Telescope images to find the masses of supernova remnants. Undergraduates being involved in research here means that our students are involved in wrestling with real problems, issues that matter in our broader community and broader society. They're addressing issues and questions that are of the most important of our time and perhaps of any time. Students tackled one of those very real issues by examining how U.S. biofuel policies in Guatemala are influencing human rights. We're actually coming up with actual policy recommendations. It's really amazing to come back and actually make something that you can hand to a congressman and say, take this to Congress and you know, make a change. These are real problems and we really want to do something about it. Undergraduate researchers are paired with faculty mentors who empower students to take ownership of their work. Student contributions to research projects help make a difference both to the university and the larger community. And for the undergrads themselves, the benefits are priceless. They take away an expertise that they can use later in their attempts to go to medical school, to dental school, go to other research laboratories, or use it for their own research. Actually being able to immerse myself within research um, has not only allowed me to develop my, you know, any, everything from analytical to research skills, but it's also provided me with uh, resources, you know, uplifting a financial burden, and allowed me to focus 100% on school. This year's Undergraduate Research Symposium is May 20th, and you can find a link to more information on our website, uwtv.org slash uw360. When we come back, we'll look at cutting edge work in another field, fashion. Welcome back to UW360 and the Foster School's Packard Hall. Students here acquire sophisticated knowledge of team-based strategic operations and relationship building. That core dynamic of modern business education is embedded in the design of Packard Hall. From classrooms to common areas, the space facilitates diverse personal and technological interaction. Alum Shalone Foster learned those lessons well. Her team at Fashion Network Seattle is passionate about promoting local designers and putting our city on the map. 
When you think Seattle, you don't necessarily think fashion, right? Well, Shalone Foster, founder and CEO of Fashion Network Seattle, is trying to change that. She says Seattle is an untapped gold mine for culture, fashion, and up and coming designers. Fashion Network Seattle is an online site that covers the fashion industry in Seattle. Our goal is to expose the people within the industry and the purpose of the industry nationwide, worldwide. Hello! Foster and her team all volunteer their time at Fashion Network Seattle a testament of their commitment to fashion. We have asked JJ, do these dates work for you? And their how? mission, to educate, entertain, and expose Seattle's real fashion industry with an online magazine devoted to expanding the boundaries of what fashion means to Seattleites. Unfortunately, people do think of REI and hiking and you know sandals with socks here. And it, Honestly, or grunge, and honestly, we haven't as a city been that for a very long time. If you go to Capitol Hill, if you go into Bellevue, you will see the same things that you see on TV nowadays. People are actually dressing in current trends. No one associates that with Seattle. And this is a local designer. It's Hayla Kay. Lovely jacket. Just really innovative with the collar. After graduating with a marketing degree from the University of Washington, Foster went on to work in business, marketing, and social media, a career she continues to follow. But a 2008 trip to Paris inspired her to start a second business that is truly a labor of love. So I had an opportunity to go to Paris Fashion Week with my best friend who's a fashion stylist and loved it, came back home, did a simple Google search for local designers and thought it was odd that no one was talking about any of these people that were in the industry. It's that curiosity that backed the idea for developing a go-to source for local fashion related content. What started as a hobby quickly turned into a platform for the Seattle fashion industry. Today, Fashion Network Seattle gets close to 100,000 visitors per month and has been named Startup of the Week by several business publications. Maybe the VIP well, has their own know. bar. Oh, so that can be on one How do we get then. anything? We'll in figure our last it out. Thing. We'll figure we did it all out. This is just an ordinary Tuesday for the team at FNS at their weekly editors meeting. <laughs> Hard to believe the sleek website is mostly run out of this home office. Can we get, can we just do the reverse? Do white with black? Foster says the family like atmosphere extends into the work. <laughs> but it definitely has an impact and I think it makes the site more personal. People really are dedicated to their work here and you can see it in their writing, you can see it in our site. I'm grateful for that. It's gonna be hot pink though. Caitlin Collins, UW grad and managing editor of Fashion Network Seattle says the feeling is mutual. It is really fun to work for Shalone. Luckily, she gives us the creative um, flexibility to kind of fit into the company as we see fit so she'll ask us what we're interested in and we kind of choose our places accordingly. Did you see all the polka dots? Well Caitlin is a volunteer she says it's a great investment of her time and her education. We have the opportunity to be doing things that a real paid position would at Seattle Magazine. Caitlin says that one of the things that sets FNS apart from other fashion blogs and e-zines is their mission to keep things close to home. We're trying to provide an accurate, more personal picture of fashion. And I think one of the best ways we get people to connect with fashion is linking it to Seattle. Another way Foster and her team keep the site local is by posting a fashion calendar. It's a resource for local fashion shows, trunk shows, and other events. Like this Seattle fashion show put on by The Stranger in the beginning of April. It is a different animal. We will never be in New York. We'll never be in LA and we are very much aware of that and that's not our goal. Our goal is to highlight the people that are making an effort here. From the sound of a recent study by Enterprise Seattle, Washington designers are making quite an effort. Turns out the Evergreen State ranked fourth in the nation in concentration and number of designers. We have someone that can design for the Capitol Hill hipster. We have someone that can design for the Bellevue mom. We have someone that can design for the downtown, um, you know, chic. I don't know what, you know, downtown. So we have, we have everything. It definitely is very similar to the way our city is naturally. And while Foster is attending the event as press, it's easy to see that she's well known in the local fashion scene. It's weird. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. I don't want to equate it to when celebrities realize that they've hit the pinnacle because it's really not like that. But I mean, it's, it's nice. It's amazing. It's, it's definitely worth the work that we're doing. Well, Foster has high hopes for the future of Fashion Network Seattle and the local fashion industry, 
She says for now, she couldn't be any happier. I could talk about fashion all day. <laughs> I can shop and not feel guilty. It's part of my job. It's amazing. I, I can't say enough great things about it. You'll find a link to Fashion Network Seattle on our website, uwtv.org slash uw360, where you can also watch this episode again and find information about all our stories. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in June.